Ah, okay. Hello. Do you hear me like that? Everybody? Even the gentleman on the back? Great. Okay, so uh, my name is Georgi Kodinov. Uh, I am uh, working uh, for the, for the My, uh, in the MySQL server team. Hello, welcome. Okay. Welcome. Okay, so um, I've been uh, working with MySQL since 2006, so I uh, remember the times where it uh, well, was the, this little Swedish company that, well, started it all. Uh, so uh, it's been an interesting ride since then, but, well, I ended up uh, from an ordinary developer uh, being a team lead to one of the MySQL uh, server developer teams. That's the server general team. So uh, what we do is uh, we uh, take care of monitoring, performance monitoring in MySQL, uh, MySQL security, and the client server protocol and uh, the client library uh, that we ship, the C client library, that's libmysql. Uh, okay, so, uh, well, that's uh, the normal slide. We'll be talking today about one of my favorite topics, uh, that's security in general and MySQL security in specific. Uh, well, so, uh, MySQL is traditionally considered as being not really secure. I mean, I've seen enterprise guys that uh, would uh, ask questions like, okay, isn't MySQL just a toy? Um, but uh, I think uh, MySQL has enough uh, features, especially with, uh, with the additional enterprise modules that we are creating for it uh, to, well, take its place in the enterprise and uh, serve your uh, users uh, well and uh, cover their security needs. Uh, of course, it's not a sitting target. Uh, we are constantly developing that part of MySQL. So we will also cover what is uh, there new in, in the, our latest GA version. Okay, so MySQL security. Uh, we'll start with the, uh, with the logical model of it. Uh, so um, on a logical level, MySQL has... Uh, obviously user accounts, and it's important to remember that those user accounts are actually consisting of two parts. Uh, those of you who are uh, familiar with other databases uh, probably expect that the user names are just a single name, but that's not the case in MySQL. They always come in couples. It's the user name and the host name. So uh, that thing is not working, okay. Uh, so. Uh, you need to be really careful because all your permissions that are granted to, to your user accounts will always be granted to a combination of a host and a username. So uh, that is a source of really nasty surprises for, uh, for the database administrators because, because they would say, okay, I granted um, access to user, uh, to user foo, but uh, user full logging in does not get those uh, permissions. And that's because, probably because, they've granted it uh, as uh, the user full logging in from the wrong host, or, well, they're not covering the host that, um, that uh, this user is logging from. Uh, of course, we have uh, wildcards in host names, uh, so it is uh, possible to grant uh, permissions to user full, no matter where uh, he is logging in from. But um, you need to be careful with that and grant your permissions properly to, to all the host names that you plan to grant them on. So uh, another thing about host names is that they can uh, also be IP addresses and they can also be masks, net, net masks. So you can, for example, grant uh, permissions to your uh, local network users uh, that differ from, uh, from your, uh, well, remote network users, for example. Uh, the other interesting part about uh, the user accounts in MySQL is that since MySQL 5.5, uh, all the user accounts are actually um, uh, perform their authentication through plugins. So um, 
Of course, we have internal plugins and we have external plugins. The internal plugins are compiled into the MySQL server code itself, but they are still plugins. So um, basically, uh, the server does not really know how to authenticate the user uh, without the help of one such plugin. So you need to be aware of uh, the plugins that uh, your server uses, your, uh, or call them authentication methods if you like, um, and uh, make sure that you are picking the right one and the one that is uh, most suited for your needs. Uh, we in MySQL uh, provide, of course, the traditional authentication plugin that reads the MySQL user table and, well, grants access based on that. But there's also others. So if you want to plug into your uh, PAM setup or if you want to plug into your LDAP setup, you can now do that through those plugins. Okay, so uh, the other important aspect is that um, there are no passwords stored into the MySQL user tables. We always um, store hashes, so it is uh, relatively safer to basically lose your uh, MySQL user table uh, because uh, there's only hashes there, so uh, one can't really restore the the, the passwords out of that. Of course, it all depends on your authentication method. If you are using your own plugin, then it will be different, but the default plugins that we supply, that's what they do. Okay, so uh, another interesting part that sets MySQL apart from all the other databases is that you don't actually need to create user accounts. The grant statements can create those for you. So if you grant something, to, to some user account that you've misspelled, uh, it will be created. So be careful with that. Uh, you may end up, uh, well, with surprises in your MySQL user table like that. If you, um, well, just do grant comments to, to users that don't exist. Uh, of course, uh, there's the normal create user comment, which I highly recommend using because it, uh, well, has additional options over the grant syntax, but still that's there for backward compatibility reasons. Okay, another important topic is that SSL is a separate layer in the MySQL protocol. So uh, what goes over the wire is, uh, can be um, superseded uh, or wrapped in an SSL context, and that's agnostic of the logical MySQL protocol. So all connections to the MySQL server, they start as, um, uh, as an unencrypted connection. And then later on, based on the capabilities of the server and the client, uh, one such uh, encrypted connection can be established later. There, there are ways to check if your connection is encrypted, and there is uh, a way to ensure that uh, your connection uh, is encrypted, like uh, if it's not, then it would just disconnect that particular user, but we'll come to that later. Okay, so uh, speaking about SSL, uh, the MySQL client and server um, combination covers most of the SSL, I call them trust levels, but well, the proper word is probably uh, verification levels, I don't know. Uh, so uh, it all starts with an unencrypted connection where, when both the client and the server are not really uh, prepared to do SSL. So that's when you don't get encryption, you don't get your keys checked, neither on the client nor on the server side. Then if you supply a key, a key pair to the server, uh, there's options for that. Um, then uh, the server will be able of establishing uh, SSL connections and handling SSL connections. Um, you will uh, also eventually need a, a certification authority file on the client just to check your server certificates. Uh, that's optional, uh, and that's, uh, well, but it's a good idea to have it if uh, somebody is doing this man-in-the-middle attack to your SSL connections. That's the way to stop it. 
so uh, whenever you supply a key pair to your servers, please uh, try to use uh, certification authorities at your clients just to check the certificate. Otherwise, it's just an encryption and uh, not really preventing men in the middle attacks. So be careful with that. Uh, Okay, so of course, uh, if you force uh, your connection to be SSL, just, I just like I mentioned a few minutes ago, that's done through require, um, the required uh, par uh, parts or uh, optional elements of the create user command. So you can say for your user accounts, I want this user to connect in no other way but encrypted. Through, through an encrypted connection. And that you say by uh, saying require whatever. Uh, some parts of the SSL um, X509 certificate. So then you get, uh, on top of that, you get uh, an ensured uh, encryption of your connection. Uh, so that's the benefit of doing that. Of course, if you can also go further and check your certificates. Uh, you do that by requiring subject. So each certificate to, to, uh, from issued from people that you trust uh, will have a subject that you should recognize. And when you recognize that, basically uh, it means that this certificate is valid for, for the purpose of uh, logging it into MySQL. And that gives you an additional benefit that the, that the server would know uh, who the client is and has ways to verify that based on the trust levels in the certificates. And of course, the last level that is the strongest level is uh, that you um, specify this additional argument, verify server certificate. There is an option for that on the client that will um, also validate your server, server key pair. Okay, so lot of options and be careful, SSL is, um, well, not really trivial to set up. Uh, it's a bit complicated, so uh, you need to be careful there. Okay, so plugins. How, how do we work with plugins? Uh, MySQL uh, is built with the assumption that um, there is this core that provides the basic functionality and it can, uh, it relies on plugins to do some specific stuff for it. So for example, one such plugin uh, is the storage engine. It's a way to read and write your data from disk. And that is something that MySQL abstracts out. And that's what it is doing with authentication since MySQL 5.5. So that's, uh, that's a real change in the authentication protocol compared to 5.1. Basically, it is extendable now, and uh, it's not fixed as it used to be in 5.1. So if you have your own clients that implement the MySQL server protocol, they may need to, uh, to evolve to fully support 5.5 and, on, and onwards because, um, well, uh, obviously each uh, authentication exchange can be different depending on how the server plugin uh, is defined for that user. Uh, and that's a problem for some older clients. In LibMySQL, we try to bundle some of the plugins because they come in pairs. That's the important part of it. Basically, the, nor the server, neither the server nor the client knows how to authenticate. What they do is they know which plugin to use to authenticate. And the, the pair of plugins uh, takes, the, takes over the network connection and can agree by themselves to uh, whether this user should authenticate or not. So that makes it similar to PAM, which basically works like that. It uh, asks questions and receives answers. Uh, and really, really flexible because, well, it can, that can be an arbitrary exchange, that can be a third party, trusted third party exchange and so on. So a lot of possibilities there with, uh, with the authentication plugins. Uh, okay, so it's the server that picks the right pair. Because uh, if I am a rogue client, I can go to the server and say, okay, I want to authenticate using this authentication method and that's all I can do. And if the server accepts that and this authentication method is flowed, then basically I would have hacked the server. So that's why the server needs to know 
the plugin that each user should use to authenticate. And the client can only provide that authentication exchange or, well, disconnect, of course. So um, you need to be careful with older clients when you try experiment with one of the newer authentication methods and double check that those older clients, they support that. So um, the, default, the, the, the default in 5.5, the default plugin, is uh, whatever uh, it used to be in 5.1. So it is backward compatible, but in 5.6 we have a new and better authentication method. So basically we are using our own infrastructure to introduce better authentication like that without, uh, well, irreversibly uh, changing the MySQL protocol. Okay, so one other important part is uh, if you have a lot of users and you need to uh, manage those users in, in groups, like for example, you want to be um, handling your, your users in an LDAP directory and uh, define your logins there and not even deal with the MySQL server uh, definitions, then you can do that uh, through plugins because they can uh, go and check uh, this external directory. But the interesting part is that they can also return a username which is different from the one that logs in. I have some pictures to show you later, but well, just some something for you to consider. Oops, sorry, wrong button. Okay, so uh, another part that is unique to the MySQL security is the notion of the locked in and the current user IDs and how are they different. Okay, so with traditional servers, basically you supply a login name and you get your authentication success or failure. Assuming that you get a success, then your log logged in name becomes your, um, well, your name that you are known uh, to the system by. So um, basically if you log in as Joe, you will be Joe for the duration of your SQL session, connect, uh, client session. Uh, that is a bit different in MySQL because of these two part names that we have. So for example, if you log in as Joe from localhost, you will be, uh, you may end up finding the, um, finding the, the row in MySQL user table that corresponds to Joe from all hosts. So there is an immediate distinction. Uh, you log in as Joe from localhost, but you end up using the privileges of Joe from all hosts, uh, from all hosts. Uh, so, um, uh, that's the difference between the locked in and the current user. The current user is the set of authentication permission that your session is using. Whereas the locked in user is the login name that you've supplied when you logged in. Okay, so that's how it works there. There is a picture. So basically Joe logs in and then he ends up using the um, uh, wildcard uh, permission uh, definition, uh, everybody at uh, data entry. So basically Joe gets to use uh, that set of permissions. And of course, MySQL provides uh, SQL functions to read those two uh, user IDs. So uh, be careful which one to use in your applications and uh, always use the right one. Uh, because the, there can be a difference between user and a current user. Okay, it gets even more complicated than that. So um, the authentication plugins add the notion of proxy users. A proxy user is really convenient when you want to manipulate your users in, uh, by their roles, practically. Uh, basically, you want to be uh, in your application when you are writing it, you want to be granting uh, individual permissions not to every accountant in your organization, but to accountants in general. And then when you hire a new accountant, you just want to say, okay, this guy here that I've hired is an accountant. 
and that will automatically grant this person the, the access rights. So that's what proxy users are for. In your application, uh, so again, Joe connects uh, to the server. That's how it all starts. <laughs> uh, and he gets to find his um, set of permissions. Basically, the wildcard um, the wildcard row in the MySQL user table that corresponds to his login ID and his host. But the difference here is that the plugin that the, uh, the, the, uh, login, uh, the, the, login, the, the login name uses uh, is defined in such a way that it returns another name. And that other name is clerks at data entry uh, in this picture here. So basically, Joe ends up using all the privileges defined not to everybody at data entry, but specifically for the clerks in data entry. Uh, so um, that way uh, you can grant uh, your permissions in your application just to a few named users, which are not really users, they are roles, because you cannot log into them uh, if you define your permissions right. Uh, but so, and then uh, have an external directory handle the mapping between your login name and your group name in MySQL. So in this way, you can uh, have all of your users in some external directory and map them from there and just define them and uh, remove them all their login IDs from there, like LDAP, for example. Uh, and of course, we are providing uh, ways for you to check all these names. The new thing here, in addition to user and current user, which are well logical and they are they uh, that we've seen in the previous slide, uh, there is this proxy user part here. That's a system variable. So this system variable returns the proxy account that was used to authenticate Joe. It is empty if no proxying was used. But if there is proxying, there was proxying, you, you will get this uh, system variable set. Okay, so that's all 5.5 five stuff. It works in 5.5, five, uh, but uh, of course it works in all subsequent versions. Okay, now that we covered the MySQL specific part of the authentication uh, and the, the logical privileges model, uh, that's the more traditional part. I hope everybody's familiar with stuff like that. I mean, uh, that's how you grant your access to your individual objects, being on the server level, uh, well, to all of your tables, to a database, to a specific table, down to a column. And of course, um, there is also a set of privileges for executing or changing stored routines. And there is one, in kind of specific, MySQL specific privilege, that's the proxy privilege. You, gra you grant it to users. So nobody can uh, just create a proxy for you and start doing this external mapping without you as a MySQL DBA enabling that for that account. So there is this additional privilege check which is well done in a typical privilege check style. Okay. So some notes about granting privileges. Again, don't forget that you are granting privileges on the combination between a username and a host name. That is mostly what <laughs> MySQL support is dealing with when uh, people get confused about their privileges. So be careful and uh, remember that it is the combination, not just the username. It can be just the username, but you need to make it explicitly that way. Okay, so uh, only the drop user command is um, guaranteed to clean up uh, all of your definitions. If you just go and delete the row from the MySQL user table and then do flash privileges, your grants will stay orphan in the rest of the system table, and that will eventually lead to problems or, well, exploitations is if somebody creates a user with the same name. So please use the SQL commands, uh, even if uh, directly fiddling with the system table seems more convenient. 
but well, they are here for a reason, so please consider using them in your applications. Um, also, one interesting MySQL-specific bit is they, that the insert privilege can be granted on a subset of columns. If you don't want people inserting into certain columns in your table, and you want always to get the defaults there, then that's the way to do it. You just grant them insert on specific columns, and then they only can uh, quote those columns when inserting. Okay, so privileges are checked against whatever the current user returns. And the user uh, function is returning the login name. A and those are different. So be sure to use the right function when you are checking uh, what the current user is. Okay, that covers the logical model. Um, any questions so far? No? Okay, so the, now the physical model is a bit more, uh, well, not that high, uh, highly logical. Uh, the, the physical model consists of the authentication table. So that's where your, uh, the information needed to authenticate your users is stored. Uh, it all starts with the mysql.user table. But of course, uh, since uh, there are plugins and the authentication process needs them, I've listed here the plugin table. That's the MySQL plugin table. Uh, so basically, the combination of the two defines how your users will log in. It used to be only the MySQL user table, but since 5.5, uh, it also relates to the plugins table. So uh, those are the two system tables that, um, well, define how your users connect. And those are the authorization tables. So that's where all the grants are stored. A user level grants, those are grants to every object in your database are stored in the MySQL user table. Database level grants are stored into the MySQL.db. Table level, column level, procedure level, and proxies. So we have system tables for all this. They all have, um, well, foreign key to, to the user table. So that's how you find them. And the primary key of the user table is the username and the host name. Uh, so that's how you build the logical model there if you need to read the system table. Of course, system tables being what they are, they are subject to change between versions. They are uh, subject to adding more system tables or removing some or reorganizing some. So, um, well, uh, you have the information schema if you just need to read your user, your user definitions. And uh, there are the SQL comments if you want to change them. Um, so that's a combination that changes much less frequently than the, the system tables. Be aware of that and try to use the, the thing that will carry your application through more versions uh, compared to the alternative. Okay, so one interesting part of how the authentication model works in, in the MySQL server. So basically, uh, all the definitions of all the users and privileges are stored in the system memory. They are read uh, whenever uh, the server starts, and they are stored in, um, in a hash, in memory hash table, or a set of hashes. Um, so uh, all the checks are done inside memory only. We don't even go and read the system tables. Uh, so that's what... Uh, happens when a user accesses uh, the authentication um, data inside the memory. It's just reads from the server memory. No, no relation to tables whatsoever. So now, when the user wants to change something, it's totally the opposite way. It's uh, all the user manipulation comments, they first go and write into the, into the tables on the disk. And then what they do, is reread or refresh the in-memory cache. 
Of course, it's automatic with the user manipulation command, so you don't need to do that last part, flush privileges. But uh, if you are uh, manipulating your system tables, you need to do f flush privileges. That's the price you pay when you, well, manipulate directly the system tables. Okay, so basically this covers the, the physical model of the authentication. So what are we doing to extend all that in, in our newest uh, GA release? That's 5.6. It has been released, um, well, this year, right? Uh, this spring, really. So we are adding a new authentication method. The authentication method that uh, was being used in 5.5 as default has been with MySQL since MySQL 4.1. And that, well, is probably 10 years now. Uh, so in 10 years, a lot has happened into the, um, well, uh, secure algorithms front. And that's what we are trying to address here by using modern uh, hashing algorithms in, instead of SHA-1, which has known problems as of now. So we are using this better and more secure hashing algorithm, SHA-256. That's much, much better and, uh, well, more robust, we hope. Uh, it also makes use of, uh, MySQL can make use of hardware acceleration. So if you are doing a lot of SSL stuff or a lot of um, hashing and user definitions and changing users and so on, you can uh, think about it helping uh, to the server with some specialized hardware. Now we are using libraries, uh, encryption libraries, industry standard encryption libraries, so we can, well, reap all the benefits that they provide. And... Um, we also uh, make sure that uh, the, your passwords, because this new authentication method, uh, it is trans right. Uh, it is transmitting um, passwords over the network, not just hashes, as the old one does, because uh, well, it needs to solve them uh, with the session hash and with the user hash. Um, so uh, we use encryption for the channel, and if there is no SSL encryption on the channel, as we seen, it's a separate layer before that, we fall back to, to using RSA keys to transmit your passwords. So, so well, that makes them secure again. Uh, okay, so that's a quick demonstration of how this new authentication mechanism works. So the server is uh, sending a random, a random uh, value to the client, and the client uses that random value to um, encrypt the password together with that random value and send it over the wire. So that's, that technique is called salting, and um, this guarantees that if you replay the session, you will not, it will not work. So you cannot just record a session and replay it and get a login. Uh, what the server does then, uh, it reads from the system table the password which is uh, um, sorted again with the user sort. Because in the traditional MySQL authentication, if two users have the same password, they will end up with the same value in the MySQL user table for password. And that's telling. Because if you have this well, unprivileged account that uh, happens to match <laughs> the role of some DBA, then you know the password of the DBA. That's no longer true with the, with the new authentication method. Uh, because there is this user sold that we use to sold the uh, values that we store in the system table. So that's why we need the password, because there's two salts now, and we need the password to calculate the hash that we uh, read from the system table. Okay, so um, if those two match, basically what the server does is calculates the, the salted password hash and compares that to the one stored in the user table, and if those two match, then it's a success. 
Okay, the other interesting part is that you can now force your users to change their passwords. That's really as stupid as it is, but MySQL wasn't providing that information, so now we have this special flag for the user that you can say, okay, please make sure that those guys will change their password, and the server will force them to do that. Okay, so um, we also are adding auditing on the password security. The server will now know uh, which password is strong and which isn't, and will possibly even reject those based on a dictionary file. It's all done in a plugin again, so if you don't like the, the current policy that we implement with that plugin, you are free to write your own, and that's easy. There's examples to that. And we also provide uh, help for the GUI clients. If you want to display this nice uh, password strength meter, now there is a special function that will go to the current password policy and evaluate the strength of your password. So, really helpful there. I've seen all kinds of interpretations of what a strong password is in MySQL. And that is hoping to unify them all. Uh, okay. So we also created an uh, auditing plugin. It stores data in XML. It does, um, it can have an adjustable impact. The more, well, impact you, you uh, the more performance hit you are ready to take, the better and complete your logging will be, but there's levels to that. So it can be slightly asynchronous, really asynchronous, and synchronous. That's the options there. And it also supports log file rotation, and uh, yeah, it's, a, it's the normal basic stuff that you find with uh, auditing. It's not, there's no filtering yet in any meaningful way, but well, we are looking into that. Okay, so uh, another important part is that we now provide an alternative uh, for your scripts. Typically, when you log into a user, you need to supply the password. And you were doing that on the command line. And there's all sorts of reasons why this is bad. And uh, we are now providing uh, an alternative. There is a new option to the MySQL client uh, that basically serves to, as a reference to a set of username and password stored in a file in your user directory. Read all about it, it's really interesting. Okay, and the last bit is that we now have connection strings. If, you, if your application wants to track some uh, metadata for the clients that log into it, there is a way to transfer the, those metadata from the client in the login RPC itself uh, directly to your server. And there is a system table that stores and reads that, that, that information, so you are now free to make metadata in, in your own applications. The server would provide for it. And of course, the usual set of refactoring. We are moving towards standard libraries, standard random generators, proven implementations that are cryptographically strong and known to be such, uh, compared to the homegrown solutions that we used to have. And we also support some uh, parts that weren't covered by the, by the SSL implementation. And that's it. Okay, so questions, anybody? No? Okay, great. Then you have been a great audience. Thank you for your time. Yeah. Can you hear me? Also, you and the audience. About the newer uh, versions, like uh, you know, um, to create a site like Joomla and uh, Drupal and all this uh, stuff. How is the connection? How are the, the security with uh, MySQL? Okay. Uh, hang on, <laughs> let me take the mic. 
So basically, uh, it works like that. Um, the Joomla, the PHP, connects to your MySQL server, and that's where all the security is. So the user model in Joomla has probably, I, I'm not really familiar how this works, but just in, in principle, basically your uh, user model in your PHP application may not necessarily correspond to the user model that you are using to access your database. Typically, in my blog, uh, my personal blog installation, WordPress, there is a single user that reads everything from the database, which is interesting, but, well, a bit scary, because that user, user's password is stored there, and, uh, well, it can do anything. Uh, so I really hope that PHP applications will do better than that and provide some mapping between their user model and the MySQL user model. More questions? Anybody? Uh, I was wondering if you can uh, get into some more details for this alternative uh, about uh, passwords in scripts. Sure. Okay, so the way it works is the following. In, in your scripts, you would typically provide a pair, a username and a password, and you store that in your script file, which is not a good idea. You need to handle your script files with care and, well, protect them and all of that. Instead, what, you are, uh, what we are offering is yet another option. Uh, you specify that option instead of your username and password, and uh, it goes, uh, that's a named path, it's a name that you define, and by that name, in a certain file that you can protect and it sits privately in your home directory, uh, that's where the username and the password are stored. So the client will do one lookup in that file, read the username and password for you, and then supply them to the server, instead of uh, having to do that in your own script. So that's the difference. Of course, if, uh, if somebody compromises this file, it's the same as compromising your scripts. So there's no added security really, but there is ease of maintenance because it's a single file that you can now put efforts to protect properly. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? No? Great, thanks again.